For so much of British history, the story of royals is the story of men. The crown, after all, was supposed to pass from father to son. Second sons, or spares, were important in case anything happened to the first son. Wives and daughters? Well, wives were there to bear and raise the sons. Daughters were useful as pawns in international diplomacy and often the means to enlarging a territory or a fortune. It's tempting, therefore, to think of mothers and grandmothers as simply a supporting caste, there to bear, nurture, and encourage sons and support their husbands. But these women were often power brokers on their own, eager to shape and able to influence history. This month, during which we celebrate Mother's Day here in the U.S., we'll be celebrating mothers and grandmothers on the podcast. Of course, we will commemorate the tragic execution of Anne Boleyn this month, considering how important May 19th was to both Anne and Elizabeth. We'll also look at the other mothers, as well as grandmothers, before and after Anne Boleyn. It's often said, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And in royal history, that is often so true. week, we looked at several women who played key roles in the reigns of their sons. Although there was no official title, Queen Mother, the idea of participating actively in power plays at court was certainly part of the lives of these women. Particularly when their sons were young, they were the matriarchs of the monarchy. So what about the Tudors? Who was the matriarch of the Tudor dynasty? We have a couple of options here. As the first Tudor king, we recognize Henry VII as the patriarch. So his wife, Elizabeth of York, could be seen as the natural matriarch. Elizabeth represented the Yorkist claim to the throne. So she was an essential part of the Tudor representing the union of York and Lancaster. She bore the king four children who survived infancy and early childhood, providing two sons, an heir, and a spare. This guaranteed the continuation of the dynasty. Definitely a successful matriarch. On the other hand... Henry VII's mother, Margaret Beaufort, was the driving force in keeping Henry Tudor alive and safe. She also kept the possibility of his taking the throne a real thing. She managed to be successful in the courts of both Lancaster and York and to develop relationships with supporters of both sides. Without her influence, it's hard to imagine Henry Tudor being able to assemble the level of support including Stanley's troops, to defeat Richard III and be accepted as king. Also, the work of a successful matriarch. Perhaps because these women share the notion of matriarch of the dynasty, they are often pitted against each other, particularly in recent pop culture representations. Margaret Beaufort is often described and criticized as ambitious and ruthless, She is portrayed as having a terrible relationship with her daughter-in-law, Elizabeth of York, based on a single quotation attributed to Don Pedro de Ayala that, quote, the king is much influenced by his mother. The queen, as is generally the case, does not like it. Some people seem to take this and run with this, turning Margaret Beaufort into the mother-in-law from hell. Elizabeth of York, on the other hand, is reduced to a caricature, beautiful but without ambitions, or opinions, or much of a personality. She is sometimes criticized for being just the good wife, instead of playing a more active role in court and politics. So the two women are set up in competition, with Margaret criticized for her overwhelming ambition and involvement with the politics of court, and Elizabeth criticized for her quietness and focus on the family. Now, we're looking at these women as matriarchs of the Tudor dynasty, each ambitious in her own way, which is a positive attribute in my book, and each focused on the family in her own way, also a positive attribute. Neither woman was perfect, but neither was the unfortunately flat caricature she's often portrayed as lately. Why is that important? Because women's role in history is so often overlooked and misunderstood and misrepresented. Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth of York deserve better. 
Although the time period promoted as the traditional man-in-charge rule, the role of royal women was actually well-established at the time. Just prior to the Tudors, two queen consorts, Marguerite of Anjou, wife of Henry VI, and Elizabeth Woodville, wife of Edward IV, were frequently decried for being too ambitious for themselves and their families and their children. The fact that people objected to their ambition indicates they were successful to some degree. As we transition from the Lancaster-York Wars into the Tudor dynasty, there was a history of women making a difference. Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth of York stepped into that place. Wives and mothers mattered. These women weren't traditional queen mothers. Margaret Beaufort had never been queen, married to a king. Although Henry Tudor's claim came through her, she never claimed the throne for herself. Elizabeth of York was married to the king, but she died before her husband, and thus was never a queen dowager or a queen mother. Nevertheless, Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth of York shaped the early Tudor monarchy and helped establish the strength of the dynasty that would last for more than a hundred years and continues to capture and hold our attention. We're going to consider them in tandem and not in competition. Two women, both mothers, who put the family business on the fast track to success. Margaret Beaufort. Margaret Beaufort was a descendant of John of Gaunt and, therefore, Edward III, through whom all the kings of this time claimed the throne. She came through the Beaufort line, descendants of Gaunt's relationship with Catherine Swinford. Catherine was his mistress when their four children were born, and Gaunt recognized them as his children and gave them the name Beaufort. Much later, Gaunt married Swinford and convinced Richard II and the Pope to declare his children legitimate. During the reign of Henry IV, a note was added to that claim that did not include permission to take the throne. As Nathan Amin points out, this notation was in no way legal. It was never brought before Parliament or voted on. It's not even clear when it was added. But the label of illegitimacy continued to haunt the Beaufort descendants. In Margaret's case, that was compounded by the trouble her father had in the reign of Henry VI. Captured in the French campaigns of Henry V, John Beaufort's military campaign later in France failed badly and he returned to England in disgrace. His death was thought to be suicide, which was a sin at the time. Margaret was just a year old when her father died, and she became the ward of the Duke of Suffolk. She was married to Suffolk's son when she was about three years old, but she later said she didn't recognize that marriage. Three years after the marriage to Suffolk, Henry VI granted her wardship to his half-brother, Edmund Tudor. She married Edmund in 1455 when she was just 12. Despite her youth, the marriage was consummated immediately, and she quickly became pregnant. Before she gave birth, Edmund was captured by Yorkist forces and died in captivity. Margaret turned to Edmund's brother, Jasper, who would remain a lifelong source of support. At Jasper's stronghold, Pembroke Castle, Margaret gave birth to her son. Margaret spent the rest of her life doing whatever she could to keep herself and her son safe and to promote his career. With Jasper's help, she married Sir Henry Stafford. This kept her in favor during the reign of Edward IV. As the wars went on and Henry VI was killed, Jasper took Henry Tudor to France, certainly with Margaret's approval and likely at her request. Jasper and Henry would spend the next 14 years in exile in Brittany and France. Stafford was killed fighting for Henry IV. After his death, Margaret married Thomas Stanley, another Yorkist supporter. After Edward IV's death, Margaret's presence at court continued, and she participated in the coronation of Richard III and Anne Neville. Even so, many suggest she was in contact with Elizabeth Woodville regarding the possible marriage of Henry Tudor and Elizabeth of York. When Margaret supported the Buckingham Rebellion against Richard III, the king stripped her of her titles and estates and awarded them to her husband. He forbade any communication between Margaret and her son, but that didn't work. She continued to work quietly on Henry's behalf, making contacts and raising money. When Henry returned to England, Richard III demanded Stanley's support, but eventually Stanley entered the field to support Henry Tudor. The Tudor supporters prevailed, and Henry Tudor was crowned Henry VII. 
Elizabeth of York. Elizabeth of York's impact on the Tudor dynasty comes in part from her place in the previous royal regime. She is closely related to three Yorkist kings. She is the daughter of Edward IV, the sister of Edward V, and the niece of Richard III. Furthermore, she is the heart of the early Tudor dynasty as the wife of Henry VII and the mother of Henry VIII. So it is understandable that she is focused on her family. She is closely related to five kings of England. Her family was the center and source of court politics and power. That doesn't mean Elizabeth's life was always easy. During her childhood, her father, Edward IV, was chased from the throne in 1470 by the forces of Henry VI. Her mother remained in England and went into sanctuary at Westminster when Henry VI was restored to the throne. That put them in the heart of London, which was by now ruled by Henry VI's advisors. When Elizabeth Woodville gave birth to a son in sanctuary, that put the family at greater risk, as a male heir to Edward IV was a threat to the ongoing reign of Henry VI. Eventually, Edward IV returned to England with troops and defeated Henry VI. He took his family out of sanctuary as he was restored to power in 1471. Elizabeth Woodville returned to sanctuary in 1483, taking her daughters and younger son with her after the death of Edward IV when Richard, Duke of Gloucester, began to take power. Eventually, young Prince Richard joined Edward V in the tower, while Elizabeth Woodville and her daughters, including Elizabeth of York, remained in sanctuary. The alliance between Elizabeth Woodville and Margaret Beaufort likely began at this time. Elizabeth of York was a key figure in this alliance, as she represented the Yorkist claim to the throne following the presumed deaths of her brothers in 1483. Many think the plan for Henry Tudor and Elizabeth to join the Yorkist and Lancastrian claims was initially planned by their mothers. Elizabeth of York, then, is a pivotal figure in moving from York versus Lancaster to York and Lancaster. Building the Tudors for all his promises to marry Elizabeth of York as part of claiming the throne, Henry Tudor did not marry her immediately after his victory at Bosworth. Initially, he had Elizabeth and her family move into his mother's grand new residence at Cold Harbor. Henry was crowned on the 30th of October, 1485. He immediately went to work establishing his claim to the throne and making his reign official. He had his first parliament repeal the Titulus Regius, which had declared Elizabeth and her siblings illegitimate. Now Elizabeth was officially princess and heir to the Yorkist claim to the throne. Henry also reversed the legal action Richard III had taken against his mother, restoring her lands and titles. He had Margaret Beaufort declared a femme sole, which meant she was independent legally and socially. No longer would Margaret have to rely on a husband for safety and support. Her lands were restored to her, not to her husband. These actions established the prominence and power of the two women who would help Henry shape his reign, his mother and his wife. Elizabeth of York married Henry VII on the 18th of January, 1486. It was a monumental event. Just months before, Henry had been living in exile, Margaret had been stripped of her lands and titles and was living in disgrace, and Elizabeth was the illegitimate daughter of the late king. Now, Henry was king of England. Elizabeth was queen consort. Margaret was an independent and wealthy woman, and if her title was elusive, her influence and honor were clear to all. The dynasty was established, and two women were at the heart of it. Eight months later, Margaret and Elizabeth were at the heart of another momentous event. The new queen had become pregnant quickly, and preparations were underway for the royal birth. Elizabeth had proven successful in her primary role to secure the future of the dynasty. In fact, by producing two sons and two daughters who survived infancy and early childhood, Elizabeth would prove to be the most successful mother of the dynasty. Henry VII seemed certain that first child would be a boy and arranged for the births to take place at Winchester, the legendary home of that other famous Welsh king, Arthur. Although not everyone agrees that the household ordinances regulating the birth of royal children were instigated or directed by Margaret, 
it's likely she was involved. After all, she and Henry were determined that Margaret's own terrible experience in childbirth not be repeated. Henry's wife was being asked to produce several children, and the king and his mother were determined to do anything necessary to make that possible. Margaret was probably in attendance when Elizabeth's first child, Prince Arthur, was born, and she recorded that event in her personal book of hours. The birth of a healthy son within eight months of marriage was a triumph for the new queen. Now plans began for her coronation, which happened on the 25th of November, 1487. The celebration started two days earlier with a grand water procession to the Tower of London. She made her official entry into the city of London the next day, dressed in royal cloth of gold with a mantle of ermine. She was very popular, and crowds thronged the streets. The next day, she proceeded to her coronation, dressed in royal purple and draped in jewels. She was crowned and anointed queen consort, with a golden crown placed on her head and a scepter in her hand. Then the royal party processed to Westminster Hall for a feast and celebration. And where were the king and Margaret Beaufort? In accordance with tradition, the king was not visible during the coronation of his consort. He and Margaret watched from a private spot. It was a triumph for all three of them. In just over two years, Henry Tudor had defeated Richard III and taken the crown taken the throne. He had been crowned king. He had restored the wealth and position of his mother. He had restored Elizabeth's legitimacy and married her. They had produced a healthy son and heir, and now Elizabeth was crowned to much acclaim. The dynasty was off to a tremendous start. The next royal child, a daughter, was named for Margaret Beaufort, who seemed to have a special bond with his granddaughter. We know Margaret Beaufort was vocal in her call for a delay in Princess Margaret going to Scotland to finalize her marriage to the Scottish king. She didn't want her much-loved granddaughter to repeat her own too early experience of childbirth. Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth of York worked together to delay Princess Margaret's journey to Scotland to marry James IV. They were united in this effort, which indicates they were not enemies and, in fact, worked well together. There is evidence Elizabeth acted independently at times. Records indicate she received numerous gifts from powerful courtiers who seemed to be attempting to gain her support for their petitions. She intervened on behalf of a Welsh tenant who objected to some of the actions of Jasper Tudor. She also wrote a strongly worded letter to John de Vere, Earl of Oxford, regarding a local manor. She was seen as a person with power and influence by those in her time. If we don't see her that way, we need to look more carefully. Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth of York were also involved in the marriage between Prince Arthur and Catherine of Aragon. As an astute political figure, Margaret certainly understood the significance of the powerful monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella marrying their daughter into the Tudor dynasty. The marriage to a Spanish, Spanish princess was a way of positioning Arthur as a future player in European politics. The glories of the first Tudor reign were nearly shattered by the events following Arthur and Catherine's wedding. Just six months later, Arthur died. It's the death of Arthur that gives us the most intimate view of Henry and Elizabeth's relationship. When he heard the news of his son's death, the king called for his wife to join him so they could mourn together. Contemporary reports describe the queen comforting Henry, reminding him they still have a son and that they are young enough to have more children. After spending time together, Elizabeth returned to her own chamber, where she was described as being overcome with grief. Her servants called for the king, who came to comfort his wife. These gestures of support between husband and wife indicate that the arranged marriage, undertaken specifically to secure the dynasty, had in fact become a genuine union. But it was a union in mourning, and things were about to get worse. True to her word, Elizabeth became pregnant once more. But this pregnancy ended in disaster, with both mother and child dying. Elizabeth's death devastated the king, especially coming so soon after the death of Arthur. When Elizabeth died, Henry withdrew from court. He seemed to tip into his worst tendencies after Elizabeth's death, giving over to paranoia and greed. 
the death of his mother also affected young Prince Henry, now heir to the throne. In an illuminated manuscript from the early 16th century, the Vox Passionale, there's an image of Henry VII being presented a book as his family mourns the death of Elizabeth of York. The king is seen, seen wearing mourning robes, and his daughters are wearing black hoods. Young Prince Henry is seen weeping at his mother's bed. This seems to ac accurately capture Henry's emotions. Three years later, after the death of Philip of Castile, Henry wrote, quote, Never since the death of my dearest mother hath there come to me more hateful intelligence. Margaret Beaufort remained a source of strength to the king through the rest of his reign. She helped him through the death of Elizabeth. She helped select members of Prince Henry's new household. She became the principal female member of the court. Later in his life, Henry wrote to his mother, quote, I know well that I am as much bound to do so as any creature living for the great and singular motherly love and affection that it hath pleased you at all times to bear towards me. When the king died on the 21st of April, 1509, Margaret was designated as chief exec executrix of his will. She arranged the funeral and worked for the smooth succession of his son. At the king's funeral, she took precedence over the other women in the family. Margaret died the day after Henry VIII turned 18 and was officially able to rule on his own. She had seen the Tudor dynasty through to its next generation. Henry VII had commissioned extraordinary tombs for himself and Elizabeth and for Margaret in the beautiful Henry VII Lady Chapel in Westminster Abbey. The grand tomb of Henry and Elizabeth was designed by the Italian sculptor Pietro Dorigiano. The tomb base is topped by the bronze effigies of the king and queen. Angels sit at each corner supporting the royal coat of arms. Margaret Beaufort's tomb rests to the right of Henry's and Elizabeth's. Her effigy was also created, created by Torrigiano in gilt bronze. She is dressed in a widow's dress and hood. Her portcullis badge and the Tudor rose surround her. At the west and east ends of her tomb are the arms of Edmund Tudor and Thomas Stanley. On the south are the arms of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. And on the north side are the arms of... Henry VIII, and Catherine of Aragon. Margaret Beaufort, Henry VII, and Elizabeth of York created the Tudor dynasty. Henry had been the monarch, but without the extraordinary contributions of Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth of York, the dynasty could not have succeeded. It was not a case of the good wife versus the mother-in-law from hell. It was two strong women leaving their own special mark on their family and the nation. Thank you for joining me to take a look at the Tudor dynasty through the focus of its two matriarchs, Margaret and Elizabeth. Next podcast day is May 19th, an incredibly powerful day in the history of Tudor women. We'll take a look at what happened in the tower on that day for Anne Boleyn and her daughter, Elizabeth. Thank you for joining us for this discussion of mothers and grandmothers of British royal history. I hope you are enjoying your mom and grandma this month. Please take a moment to subscribe, like, rate, and share the podcast with a friend. Thank you, thank you, and I'd love to hear from you. Let's keep shaking up history together.